all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my Amen. Bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. It's great to have you here it's on this final day of July. It flies by, doesn't it? Yeah. Beautiful weather. Um, we have a few announcements initially, and uh, we do have our men's breakfast this coming Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. We want to invite all you guys out, bring some food. We will eat food and uh, hear the word of God. So it'll be a great time. It's always an awesome time. So this coming Saturday, 8 o'clock. Also, if you are considering going to the IAGM conference, I believe it's the last weekend in August, please sign up at the Connect desk, which is right through that door. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to see details about that, um, as well as in your bulletin. Uh, so be considering that as well. Also, I noticed this yellow page. Not sure is that if Dave is responsible for that or who included that, but it's a great uh, little reference or resource to re review on how to follow Jesus, how to receive the gospel, how to become a Christian. So something for us to read and perhaps uh, pass on uh, to someone that you might be praying for, uh, maybe someone struggling. Uh, it's a, just a, a quick little reference for, uh, for those. And continue to pray for... Um, members of this church that are listed here who are just going through things. We all will be at some point. If you're not now, just wait. <laughs> Doom and gloom, huh? No, not really. But it's, I just, um, we visited uh, Don and Rita yesterday, and Rita, was, Rita you know, need, really keep her in prayer. Um, she, she's going in for a biopsy. She might have cancer again. And so, you, and you know what she said? She says, I don't know how I would ever begin to face this without knowing that you, you pray. You know, we might think it's a small thing. We stop in the course of the week and say a little prayer. But um, 
It means the world. It means everything. I shouldn't say it means the world, but it means heaven, right? To people who are going through it. Um, so continue to do that. I, and she just wanted to let you know, know how much she appreciated that. Um, so keep on praying for her and, and Don, who's also going through a lot as well. So, Lord, we thank you for Don and Rita. We ask your blessing on them. We ask for healing. We ask for comfort. We ask for your presence above all in the midst of all that they go through. And we pray, Lord, for their son, Jeff, who we were able to minister to yesterday and um, just spend some time with. And so we ask you would just speak to our hearts. Our hearts would hear you this morning as your word is spoken. Now in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, uh, a tremendous verse. I, I don't know this verse stuck to me first, John 5.13. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you might know that you have eternal life. Isn't that amazing? That these things are written so you would know, not wonder, not hope, not speculate, so that you would know that you have eternal life, so that you would continue to believe on the name of the Son of God. See, it's like it just keeps going. We believe on the name of the Son of, Law, Son of God, then we know we have eternal life, and then we believe on the name of the Son of God. It just keeps going, right? And I, and I was considering, um, you know, speaking to um, that young man, younger man, he's not real young, Wayne and I were over, um, Donna Rita's, and he, he had actually proven mathematically the existence of God. And he had been to college, and he says, well, I have a very, very high IQ. I don't know what it is. I think I have my, I have to at least have a double digit IQ. I'm hoping, right? Yeah. And I don't know how high it was. I don't know why someone would say that. But he, the only problem is, even though he proved the existence of God to his fellow students, he didn't know he had eternal life. He didn't believe on that name. He didn't understand that he could possess God and God could possess him. And these verses I really minister to me. Um, these are like four facts that define our life in Christ that gives us assurance. And the first one, how, how do we know? Sometimes people want, how do I really know I'm a believer? Or how do I know my neighbor's a believer? How do I really know? I mean, can we, we can't know 100%. We can know for us, if we read the, the Bible, we can know for us, but we can't really necessarily know for others. And I don't know whether that young man, as Wayne and I were ministering to him, was a believer or not, but he did not seem to possess these indications uh, in First John that we see. First uh, John's an amazing epistle that gives us incredible assurance for our salvation. And the first one is confession of the incarnation. In First John 4.15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides or dwells in him and him in God. Isn't that amazing? We live in God, God lives in us. If we confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Another one is possession of the Spirit. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us. Because He has given us His Spirit. And I, how do we know we have the Spirit? Where, which, where, are you, where are you being led? Are you being led to the things of God or are you being led to the things of the world? See, that if you have the Holy Spirit, he will always, the Holy Spirit in you will always lead you to God. There will be something in you that just causes you to want to get nearer to God, to know God, to be with believers. And you won't even know why. More than you want to be in the world. See, our soul interfaces with the world, right? Our soul kind of interacts with the world, is perceptive to the things of the world, the pleasures of the world. Lust of the world, all of these things, our soul. But when we receive the Spirit of God, we are now connected with God. And our, and our spirit interfaces with the Spirit of God. And so there's something in us that just wants to draw us towards God. And that's the Spirit of God living in us. And then the third one is our love of our fellow men. Love of our fellow men. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. So loving one another is another way of knowing that we believe that we're saved. You know, there's something, we just love each other. I don't care what you did. I, I don't care what team you root for. 
uh, we just love each other. We just love being together. And that doesn't necessarily exist in your family, does it? It might. But a lot of families, people don't look forward to getting together necessarily. Right? But, but in the church, there's something different about our fellowship. The basis for our, our fellowship is Christ in our midst. You know, and we love, I love hearing the Christ in you, what he's done for you. I love knowing your faith, what's happening in your life, that God is helping you th through a struggle. Hearing Rita, God, God is faithful because he's strengthening me through your prayers. I love hearing that. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. We know we believe. It wasn't there before. Right? This love we have for one another. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. 1 John 4, 21. And then the last one is the indwelling of God. And this is amazing. The indwell we know God is living in us. We know he is. Just ask me. I know he is. I know it. I don't, how do I know it? Well, we just mentioned it. We, we have a confession. We're not afraid to confess him. We confess him to the world. We confess him before the kingdom of darkness. We proclaim the reality of God and what he's done for us to whoever. We can't help it. Right? Listen, Barbara, you can't shut the woman up. She's going to talk about Jesus. Right? When she goes somewhere, she's going to talk about Jesus. Pastor Chet, can't shut him up. Right? He's going to talk about the Lord. He's confessing and proclaiming because he's in us. And you know what? When he indwells us, there's something that takes place. There's a fullness that indwells us that we can't contain. And that's what this says. Before long, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. Before long, in, in John 14, 19, before long, the world will not see me anymore. Why will the world not see Jesus anymore? Because hell is going to crucify him. All hell is going to come against him. And you know, that hasn't stopped. All hell still is crucifying him in this world. All atheists are still crucifying him. They're still trying to remove him, bury him. Let's put him in the ground. Gone forever. Right? And this is what Jesus is saying. The world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. What is that day? That's the day of the resurrection. That's the day when Christ rose from the dead and we realize that everything he said was true, that God defines reality, that God defines our life, that God truly is in us and we're in him. Whatever he said was absolutely true. What greater proof would you need than someone dying and coming back from the dead? That his words were true. And then it goes on, whoever, whosoever has my commandments and keeps them. He is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him in John 14, 21. And there's this overflow that takes place that we can't contain because he is loving us. The fullness of the Spirit was possessed by Christ. And out of his fullness in John 1, 16, we have all received that fullness. Just taking a drink from the well. From the fullness of God. Anytime you're thirsty, anytime you're hungry, you walk to the well, you walk to the table to receive the fullness of God. And, it, and, and it's like, wow, there's a lot more here than I can eat. This is like the ultimate buffet. It's the Spirit of God filling me up. I was lonely, I was empty, I was lost, and I came to the table. I came to God's buffet, and He filled me. He filled me. It started to overflow. It, it just kind of seeped out of me. Right? It just seeps out of us. Can't contain it. Wow. Because he's in us. And we're in him. It's like the woman with the alabaster box. He broke it on the Lord's head. Remember the, the spike nard? The most costly material. It was, what was it said? It's, uh, it's, it's just such a beautiful picture in John 12, 3. It was the Tiffany diamond. It was the gold standard at that point in time. The thing that had the highest value. And she couldn't contain it. She had to pour it out. The thing I have is so precious. I have to pour it out. 
It's seeping out of me. I'm going to pour it out on the Lord. And that's who we're ministering to, isn't it? When we go to someone, we're ministering to Christ. To the least of these, my brother, and that which you do, to the least of these you do unto me. And you know what? It pours out. Right? He causes us to triumph. 2 Corinthians 2.14. I love it. He makes manifest the savor of his knowledge, the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. It starts to pour out. It pours out. Why? Because we let him pour into us. We let him pour his life, his heart, his joy into us. And now we can't contain it. Amen? Lord, we thank you this morning that we are in you and you are in us, Lord. That's because of what you've done for us through the crucifixion and the resurrection. And Lord, you pour out a blessing, you pour into our hearts. Help us, Lord, to pour that forth. Continue to pour it like the woman who anointed you. Lord, may we anoint you. May we just continue to pour out our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning, everybody. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Prepare your heart to listen. May the Holy Spirit open all our hearts, our minds, our bodies, that we might receive and that we might be changed. Hard to change yourself, isn't it? Anybody ever try? How many self-improvement programs have you tried in life and failed? Oh, I did most of us fail, right? I fail. Uh, but I know somebody who never failed, and that's God. And uh, like the IQ thing, uh, IQ, yeah. Yeah. Idiots qualified, maybe we could use that for us, right? Sometimes the less you are, the more God can reach you, by the way. True? Smart people perish because of lack of knowledge about God. And they become idiots, and they're qualified to get saved. But it's hard to get saved, somebody that thinks he knows everything, right? I, I know everything, but I don't know God. How's that work for you, right? Which is the most obvious thing in life, that we were created by an intelligent being. And the amazing part is he loved us, and loved us enough to die for us on a cross in humility when he had nothing to be humble about. And yet he died for the proud, which is you, by the way. Right? And he calls us to be like him. Well, we are in Acts chapter 3. This is Peter's second service or sermon. Uh, he will preach here. Again, it starts with a miracle. And anybody who's a sinner preaching and being filled with God is a complete miracle. If you're saved today, you're a complete miracle. The Holy Spirit uh, is in you. Isn't that good? Now, I don't know where he is in you. He might be, you might keep him in one room, right? You might keep him in the Holy of Holies and sew back up the uh, curtain that was rent. It's a tough sew job because it was about like, I don't know how many feet thick, the curtain of the Holy of Holies. But maybe you're spending your life sewing him up. I'm saved. I'm going to sew him in there. Keep him in there. Where the Holy Spirit wants your whole life. He wants your mind, he wants your emotions, and he wants your will. Like any true lover does, he wants all of you, he doesn't want part of you. He wants you in a personal life, right, intimacy, but he also wants you in a public life. He wants to show you off. He wants to say like he did to Job, to Satan, like, have you considered my servant, fill in the blank? There's none like you in all the earth. God gets the glory anyway. If you go to heaven and you really haven't really glorified him in your life, well, he gets the glory for saving your sorry life, right? Uh, he finds you sorry. Hopefully you change from there. That's called repentance or change. Or even if, uh, you know, my life manifests, God, to some way, shape, or form to the world around me in a testimony 
that I know that I know that I know God's real, I'm still an unprofitable servant. He gets the glory again. Because everything I have, I didn't produce. He changed me. True? He changes us. And we need change. We are not like him. I need all the motivation I can. We talked about this in New Believers class today. Uh, we, we, we did a little hip hop of uh, Psalm 119.9. Uh, Remember that one? How shall a young man change his ways? By taking heed to your word. And then 11 is uh, I hid the word in my heart that I would not sin against him. Right? His word dwells in me in Psalm in Colossians 3.16 in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, always making melody in my heart. How's that happen when I'm so filled with me? Well, it happens by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a process. So we're going to look here at Peter's sermon here. We're going to speak Mostly from uh, verse 19 to the end, 26, which is a key thing about repentance. And you got to understand repentance before we get there and the need of it. Most of you and most of Christianity hates the word. It's such an antiquated word. It just means change your mind. Uh, he's going to preach that to these people. They crucified him and he tells them that. But they have to change their mind about Jesus, that he is the Messiah. They have to change their mind. Do you have to have to change your mind on anything? When we look at repentance, you've got to understand that for priority's sake, there's something called first mention principle in context. And the first mention principle of repentance are in Matthew chapter 3 and Luke 4, which is the beginning of John the Baptist ministry and in for the beginning of Jesus says ministry and they both preach the same thing repent for the kingdom of God is at hand kingdom of God gives you the ability to repent you can't repent unless you know what you're changing to and you surely can't repent in your own sin nature because you're locked in, you're in bondage, you're in prison. You don't have a key or someone to open the door. As Pastor Steve has preached on that idea, we've emphasized it. Somebody's got to open the door. And the government of God comes in your life and that gives you what? Discipline and control over your life that you can make the changes and they are what? They are seen. They're internal and they're external in life. So let's look at this context here of this chapter. Remember, the first things we talked about in this idea is the idea of Peter preaching Christ. Six names he gave for Christ. We talked about servant, Jesus, holy one, prince of life, just, Christ. Six prophetic names of the Messiah he gives to this crowd of 5,000 to emphasize that Jesus was the Messiah. This is all good preaching centers around Christ. He's the author and finisher of our faith, so we're going to talk about faith. The beginning of it should be about Christ, the end of it, and I assume everything in between should be about Christ. And then he picks up the tempo and he changes it and he preaches what? An indictment to them. This is the essence of all good preaching. And, and I do this that you might be indicted, that I might be indicted for what? Change. I need to change. I need to be more fruitful. Well, I'm fruitful enough. Well, really, no, he wants more fruit. I have trees in my backyard. And you know what? I thought they were doing really good. Then I went to my daughter's house and I saw her blackberries. And I realized I wasn't doing that good. That I didn't have as many blackberries. She, I, I, I had to cast down covetousness because she had more blackberries than I had. And uh, yeah, so then I got a what? Prune. Prune the bush that it might yield more blackberries. Now, this is hard. Repentance is really hard. It takes like a lot of work, you know? We don't like a lot of work. We got to see God. We got to see Him to be able to repent. We got to realize that our life is His. If we get saved, we should realize how much God loves us. True. 
He died on a cross for us, and then we should follow him, prioritize him as the key relationship of our life, which will give life to every other relationship we have. Without that life, you give people you, and you don't even want you. True? I want Jesus. That's why we have a good conversation here, Pastor Steve, because we talk about Jesus. That's our agreement with each other. We come from different races, nationalities. We come from different social backgrounds. We, we live different. But you know what we have in common? The greatest thing. Christ. And so we fellowship on that basis. I mean, we fellowship with what we like. See, I grew up in the, in the 60s and 70s, so like I, like I listened to all the stuff, the causes, right? Put down war. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, we can change the world. I'm like, yeah, we can change the world. But every time you went to change the world, it was really about like, like inebriating yourself in some way, shape, or form and living in sin, right? What kind of world are we changing into here? True? I'm like, yeah, and then everybody ended up in puke, right? And then you needed to get back to the garden. Remember that? We got to get back to the garden, man. Oh, yeah. But they found out when they got to the garden, you had to work. That's why people don't want to be farmers. That's why the prodigal son left. His father probably worked him half to death. Right, Danny? It's a lot of work to guard, isn't it? Farmers work hard. Sun up, a good farmer. Sun down. Every day. Especially if you've got cows. Every day. Milk. Yeah. It's hard. But it's way worth it. You're going from, in this idea here, indictment from a sin nature that needs to be indicted because it's in rebellion against God to what Peter calls in 1.4, 1 Peter, the divine nature. Like God. Yeah, that's a good swap, right? Rags for riches. So he indicts them, and, and one of the things we talked about last week were the names, but also the indictment. He's giving these people a second chance. They already crucified him. This is a great time for what? Judgment. Now you got the 5,000 people here who crucified and denied him. It's a great time just to level them all. It's like John and, and, and James, like, let's just cast down fire right now. We got them all in one group. We don't have to go look for them. Let's just burn them all. But he gives a message of grace again, doesn't he? Isn't that great about your life? God's hand's always stretched out with a message of grace. There's always a hand of judgment, but there's always a hand of grace that he wants you to take before the time is over. We don't judge anything before the time. Some of the worst of you out there can be the best of us. Because he who is forgiven much loves much. He for the reason he came is to give what? The main thing in my life is forgiveness. It really is. His mercy endures forever for me. He forgives me. And he doesn't just give me two chances. He gives me 70 times seven chances. But I want to know him. I want to know him. So he begins here after he indicts them and he gives them hope. In 17, verse 17, he talks about the idea that they did this ignorantly. He says, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it ignorant. You crucified him. Pilate wanted to let him go, but you did it ignorantly, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. See, he wasn't just occupied with um, them. He's occupied with past, present, and future all the time. He's eternal. He's not just dying for them. He's dying for everyone that lived in the past that called on his name, that were waiting for their redemption, he's dying for them. He's dying for everybody in the future that hasn't been born yet. That's how great your God is. He knows them. He's dying them in the, for the future. He died for us at this time and was raised. But the prophets, at the mouth of the prophets, Christ would suffer. 
So that had to be fulfilled and has thus been fulfilled. And then he says this, repent, repent. Could you try to make this one of the, for homework, try to make it one of the, the greatest words in your life? It means change your mind. Change your mind. The scriptures say that we in maturity should have in 1 Corinthians 2.16, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. We can judge all things, but yet with mercy, because we have what? The mind of Christ. We're the, we're the people that give people 70 times 7 chances. We don't give up on people. Why? Why don't we give up on people? Because we have the God of all hope in a hopeless world. Do you realize what you have? You don't. We don't. We don't. We have to think about it. Right? But it's hopeless. Yes. Your change is hopeless with you. Your fix-it programs have failed. But there's still hope. Because we have the God of all hope. All hope. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, thus fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy in uh, Psalm 33, that the mark, blessed is a man whose sins are what? God doesn't mark your iniquities. He doesn't mark them, because who would stand in that place? But that God doesn't mark our iniquities because of what Christ did on the cross. He died for them. To be converted that you sins may be blotted out, Wiped completely out, not to be found again. So that the times, and this is where we want to live, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. Now he's speaking to Jews here. Remember this book of Acts, we kind of Christianize it like it's Christians. And they became Christians, but they were Jews. This is a much a Jewish book, and more so really than it is a Christian book. That's why we love Israel, because we're grafted into them, not them to us. They need us, and we need them. That's a good relationship, right? He's there. And refreshing may come in. It's always a catharsis when you repent. It gets rid of it. I mean, you know, we, we talk about cleanses for health. Like, you know, I'm in like, okay... How could I make myself better? Well, I need to make my body better because my body carries the rest of me, right? I'm like the ark. Like in the Holy of Holies, which we try to keep God in, in our life, the ark was moving. They carried it. They really carried it in the battle. True? They lost it. Uh, under under uh, In the Old Testament, they lost it. But... Uh, Normally, it was carried and crossed the Jordan River. They carried the presence of God. You're like carrying the presence of God. We need that. I need God to be with me, and I need to know he's with me. And I need to remember. Because it's easy to forget, isn't it? That's one of the great tragedies in life, our memory. It's so good to memorize Bible verses again. I'm, I'm having a great time doing it. Why? I need to remember God's promises towards me, lest I forget them. And that's very depressing, right? I need to remember. He blots out. Refreshing comes in like a catharsis in me, like a cleanse. And you feel so much better when you do it that you get the waste out of you in all different forms. But you know what? You feel better because what? You're refreshed. Your life is refreshed. Body, soul, and spirit, mind, emotions, will. You are in the newness of life, and only God can really do this, but repentance is a tool he has to use. He wants you to change. He's not done with you yet. Paul had to change. Paul said, listen, I haven't arrived yet. I, I have not arrived uh, I've done all these amazing things, but I'm pressing on toward the mark of the high calling. John writes it in 1 John chapter 3. That was in Philippians chapter 3. 1 John 3, John writes it, say, listen, we're looking forward for one thing, that we might see him. When we see him, we're going to be like him. Amazing. Can I see him right now? Yeah, you can. 
If you seek him, you'll find him and you'll see him without an image because he has no image that you would make a statue or idol with. But you can know he's real. He can appear to you in different ways, different forms, like the air I breathe. I know it's real. And I look for the God that's invisible, and I know it, the air is real, and I know God made air, and he's more real. But when I see him, and the more you see him in this life, through that veil, which we talked about a couple messages ago, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we behold the Lord through a veil, dimly. Where the Spirit of the Lord, there's liberty. The Holy Spirit reveals what happens. I see Him and I'm changed from what? Glory to glory. God boasts on me more. Do you see their life? They stop doing drugs. Do you see it? Do you see it? Who is this? This is my son. Do you see He stopped drinking? This is my son. Do you see He's come back to the house of God? This is my son. Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So you can please God. You getting this? You can please God. This is my daughter who picked up the Bible and memorized two verses. She hid her with the word in her heart that she wouldn't sin against me. In her mind. This is my son who was depressed all the time, memorized every verse, verse on depression. And guess what? They have joy now. Because they know the joy of the Lord is their strength. And they know they can drink another cup of joy because again, he says what? Rejoice in Philippians 3.3. 3. Again, I say rejoice. This is my son who lives in joy in a depressing world and a depressing life, but lives in joy unspeakable. See what the Word of God can do? Created me a new heart. Right? I have to change. Is that not a good change? Is it a good change to get rid of substance abuse for substance use because Jesus Christ and here in uh, Hebrews 11, 1 is our what? Substance of things hoped for. He is the hupotasis of God. He is the expressed image of the Father in 1, 3 of Hebrews. The same word. He is what? Substance. And you know what? I'm going to use him because he's unusable up. He has resources beyond my imagination. And I'm going to use every resource he gets, gives to me. Church, fellowship, prayer. Memorization. You got it. I want it. That's called an addictive life, by the way. I'm addicted to the work of the ministry. Work doesn't bother me anymore. I don't have to get a street sign. Why, there's help wanted ads down the street uh, on signs saying, we need workers. I don't need to get a street sign because and, and, I hate work so much, I'm not going to work. You were created to good works. Ephesians 2.10. So I need to love work. You see, the heart is, your flesh hates the words of God that change you. They love the words of the world that enslave you. They love the words of the world that enslave you. We hang around people that do what we want to do. I like to hang around Christians that want to talk about God. If you're a Christian, you don't want to talk about God, you, you bore me. Because the only thing that really isn't boring is God. Why? Because he's new every morning. And great is his faithfulness. Peter's preaching is, Peter is supercharged right now. He has just got forgiven. He denied Christ three times a few months before. He is risen up to be what God wanted him to be to the Jew. He is an ignorant man. He may not even be able to read at this point of his life. How's that for encouragement? You think about your IQ. And yet, he's got the boldness to preach despite maybe facing crucifixion or he gets beaten in the next chapter for what he did. How many of you ever got beaten for your Christianity? Peter did. 
Peter will be crucified at the end of his life with his wife, watching her die. So Peter is a, uh, a superhero of the faith. Yeah, I like the times of refreshing when my sins are gone. Don't you? Do you understand what repent? My sins are blotted out. Well, you need five years of counseling. No, I needed one minute of counseling. I needed a second of counseling when I saw his face. Because his face I saw, when I saw his face, I knew his love and I knew his mercy. And every sin I had was buried at the bottom of the sea. Oh, but that's not really, you need more. No, I need nothing. I believe it. And therefore, all of a sudden, my doors of forgiveness and freedom and refreshing have come open to me. And you know what? They have no power over me. He delivers me from the guilt of sin and the, what? the power to sin no more. Why? Because if somebody really does that for you, it gets rid of all your baggage, your garbage that you've been carrying around. Don't you love that person? Why would I want to go open a garbage bag again? You see how this is supposed to work? It's a relationship with what? All of the servant, Jesus, the Holy One, the Prince of Life, the just, Christ, the Anointed One, man, God. Where's all the refreshing come? From the presence of the Lord. In His presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you want more than that? In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You want to see what the world has? The next new thing? God has a better assembly line than the world has. Every day. New. Enjoy the boot. That's our Lord. He preaches this to them, repentance. Because you know what? You have to leave, to have a relationship when you're, when you're married to the world. You know what? When you're enslaved by the world, you have to leave this, okay? <laughs> no wife wants like your old girlfriend showing up at the door, right? True? Ah, uh, she needs to go. I remember an old girlfriend of mine came to our wedding. It was like a, a kind of a sore spot, you know. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, she can't. I don't know. She can't. She's nuts. But yeah, that's just the way it is. It's like nobody wants that, right? Like you know, if you're gonna come to me, you gotta leave her. You gotta leave that to come to me. I'm not taking you with that to come to me. You gotta get rid of that. I get rid of this relationship with the world. Love not the world, neither the things of that are in the world. In 1 John 2, 16. For they're what? They're not desire, they're lust. Lust of the world, right? The pride of life, the lust of the eyes, what you see. I don't see, I, I know Jesus is real, I know his presence, but you know what? I seek the God that's invisible that made all these things that I see. And then we corrupted him with hell, right? But God's going to redeem him with life. And again, the times of refreshing come in. That he might send Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that good? Who was preached to you before. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restorations come in which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. So get the idea, when it talks about the time of refreshing to the Jews, which can be literal for my own soul, but it's talking about the millennial reign of Christ, because the Jews were in a system, remember this, they were in system. you think you have it hard, they were in systems ingrained in them. That it was all about the Messiah coming back and setting up the kingdom. And this wasn't a kingdom that was going to happen for centuries later. Hasn't happened yet, but that God was going to restore. He's going to restore. And if you want to be there, you've got to be in Christ. If you're there 2,000 years before, you still got to get in Christ. You get in Christ to be there. Why? Because the kingdom has a king. And he doesn't won't suffer rebellion. 
In fact, if you rebel with that prophet, he goes on to talk here, it was a quick judgment. He goes on to talk about this in this restoration of the millennial, because God has to fulfill his promises to Abraham, which he hasn't done, but it's which he will do. Why? Because if he doesn't do them, he's a what? Liar. And if he breaks one promise, what good are all the rest to lean on, right? This is going to happen, literally. Has been spoken by the law, uh, the, the prophets since the world began, I left off. 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me. Probably, in other words, he'll be a man from the brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. This is the millennial. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet, there's still a sin nature in the millennial, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. This will be a real revival. This will be a real fear and love motivation strongly. This will be where everyone will say in that day, know the Lord. They won't say know the Lord because everybody will know him. He's on earth ruling. True. And so this will permeate the land. And the backdrop of that is the great Armageddon fire still burn of judgment and a devastated world that he begins to remake for the millennial yes and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow as many have spoken have also foretold these days remember this is the first coming of Christ which precedes the second you and the sons of your prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father saying to Abraham in your seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And we share that blessing. To you first, God having raised up his servant, Jesus. What a title. Sent to him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Turning away every one of you from your iniquities. I want to talk about repentance. I mean, for most people, you know, there's sins we do that we, we, we confess, but we do them again. Struggle with that. There's things in your sin nature that you do and you never get deliverance from. And you wonder why. And then you give up. Most people give up on holiness in their life. They figure God has to take them the way they are. But they don't know how to repent. And I want to teach you one thing some God does to get you to repent what real repentance really is in your life two things come in that motivate repentance here to them here in this context he uses two things primarily he uses that they killed the messiah they killed their messiah do you know we all killed the messiah you understand that right to realize you all have a sin nature, your sin killed the Messiah. Nobody really killed the Messiah in the sense, even though he used Pilate. Pilate was innocent more than the Jews. They had the greater damnation because they knew to a degree and they gave him up and even broke their own laws to give him up to them. And he was crucified. So the responsibility was to the nation of Israel, especially to the leaders. Pilate was in between this. He tried to persuade him to let him go. They wouldn't budge. They said, you're no friend of Jesus. And so, or, or Caesar, they used that against him politically. And he knew what Caesar, and Caesar did do to him. He exiled him later in his life. But he knew what Caesar would do. So again, you're in a rock and a hard place. He offered him up. But really, no one took his life. Jesus said that. No one takes my life. I do what? I lay it down. What did he say to Pilate? If this was a battle, I'm a king, but if this was really a battle, I could call legions of angels right there. Right now. This has been foretold that I would do this. I delight to do my father's will. I delight, number one, he had bookends just like we should have bookends. He delighted to do his father's will. He was sent to do this. But he also delights for the joy set before him in Hebrews chapter 2, which is you. That he might save many brethren by doing it. He had delight on both sides and he had, like many things, he had an awful cookie in between, right? 
But he had joy on both sides of the equation. And so he went through it knowing the joy, knowing you, and he did it because he loved you. He loved you. And he was going to make that right. And so he died on the cross. So no one took his life. I have to know, just like they do, they literally did this, but that my sin put him on the cross, right? Who should be on the cross? You or Jesus? You. I'm not that bad. Yes, you are. Even saying that makes you worse than me. I'll tell you I should be on that cross. Yeah, you should be on that cross, but you're not. That's why you're a living sacrifice in Romans chapter 12, because you should be on the cross, but you were kept alive. You were co-crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, you live, but not I. For Christ lives in me. That's what's supposed to happen. My love lives in me. That's what lives in me. The one I love lives in me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you say that about your life? I hate God. Lord, I love you and I'm going to what? I'm going to give my life for you. That should be a response, right? That, should, that sounds like a normal response. Sounds like a marriage vow almost. Hey, I love you and I'm going to give my life for you. I bear the marks of my own body. No, I'm just teasing my wife. I would hope at the marriage vow she'd look at me and say, and she did, I love you and I give myself for you. Through anything. Sickness, health, trial. I love you and I give myself for you. See, Paul understood that. Even through crucifixion. And so what do we do? Repenting is excruciating to the flesh. It says you're wrong. I can't even tolerate being wrong. This is Christianity. I need to know I killed the Messiah. But I need to know too that what? He's gracious. I did it ignorantly. I was born in sin. This is what I knew. But now I know the Lord. Now I know who he is. Now I know that. And guess what? That knowledge, why the word changes me, why it's hidden my heart and it needs to dwell, it's making me more like him, more like the mind of Christ like we talked about. And what's happened to me? I'm able to what? Begin to govern. You have to govern with your mind. See, many people repent in the idea of emotions. Oh, I really feel sorry about that. I feel guilty about that. But they don't start with the place that can govern it, which is their mind. I have to have substance to be able to lean on and draw strength from to be able to fulfill what repentance really is. So many people will repent and say, well, I really feel bad about that. Anyway, what's for dinner? Right? It has to hit my mind. Why? Because the kingdom's about government. You can't govern without your mind. You have to know what the laws are. My goodness, these people are faced with tremendous change. They're coming out of the most legalistic system probably in the history of the world. 650 laws of not what to do and six, 250 laws of what they're supposed to do to be righteous. And now Jesus is saying, Throw it all away. It's me. And love. And love is the fulfilling of the law. Have a relationship with me. You won't want to hurt me. Because you love me. And since I'm the dominant one, I know all things, and your IQ is uh, idiot qualified, but I know all things, then listen to me. I'll take you with me. I know all things. Trust in me with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your paths. Boy, you don't know that person. You're kind of lost still, even though you might be saved. Your GPS has gone down. Throw the phone and the communication out the window. You'll do what's right. 
in 14.12 of Proverbs in your own mind. That was 3, 4, 5, and 6 of Proverbs. We're in memorizing phase now, right? And I can't memorize. You can memorize. It's hard. But you know what the biggest thing about memory? I want to know that verse. I want to know it. I want to know that verse. My life depends on knowing that verse. Not like, yeah, that's a nice thought. Nah, 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 nah. I don't feel like memorizing that verse. True. I don't need to memorize that verse. I hid the word in my heart that I wouldn't hurt you. One sin, sin hurts God, by the way, right? But when you overcome sin, God's like, there's my son. There's my son. He just overcame his addiction. He used to watch porno. He hasn't turned it on in a month. That's my son. See what I'm saying? He hid the word in his heart. And it wouldn't hurt me. How much do you love God? He's everywhere. Beholding the evil and the good. He likes to look at the good, by the way. Because he's good. Hates evil. Can't look at it. Separates him from you. Experientially. God will give us this. Five reasons John MacArthur, those who like MacArthur, I thought they were very good in a tape he played. So I thought I couldn't add to them. I thought I'd use them. He uses five things to nudge us to repent. Number one, knowledge. They knew what he was saying. Because they lived it. All the, They knew the miracles Jesus did. That was knowledge. I had knowledge of the miracles. They saw miracles. They knew the knowledge of who Jesus Christ was. They knew he was crucified. They knew what the Sanhedrin did. They saw the phony trial. All these things spread like wildfire in a community. They knew the truth of what they were saying, and the man lived. They also knew the scriptures. And so what he was saying was knowledge. They had knowledge of these things. In the word and in life around them, as Jesus was the word made flesh. Number two, their emotions. See, you have to have mind, but your emotion, this is how you're made up. You're a living soul. Your mind, emotions, and your will have to repent and change. Not just your emotions. Most people repent with their emotions, which is the sorrow of the world. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry it hurt you, but next month I'm going to do it again. This time I'll try to hide it more. You see? Isn't that an addiction thing? Kid gets caught doing drugs. The mother takes it all away. Oh, I've changed. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm sorry I, 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 you found out. I'm sorry you found whatever my paraphernalia was. I'm sorry. I'll never do it again until next month. But I'm going to hide it better. I'm going to hide my stuff better. I live that stuff. Right? I don't want to hurt my mother. But you know what? I like my sin better than I like my mother. That's your flesh, right? No, I love my mother because God loves her and I love her. And you know what? I'm changing. Mind, emotions, and what? Will. Will is the act of I might begin to convert. And the two terms here are repentance and conversion. One is change your mind, which is inward. I, God looks at my mind. He searches my mind, right, that I really want to change. And then my emotions, like I, I see it. I have godly sorrow instead of sorrow of the world. In 2 Corinthians 7, 9, I have godly sorrow not to be repented of, not to change my mind about. My, it's hitting my heart. And what happens then? Conversion. What's conversion? Public display of this. Yeah, you know what? It hit here and here, but I'm going to go hang out the corner with my drug addict friends. Even though Proverbs 1 and Psalm 1 say don't hang around with them. 
because it will corrupt me. Because we're people of relationships. And I just traded my relationship with God and people who love God for what? My old friends. And my old friends will subdue me. And I'll be right back in the mud. So conversion is an outward expression. There's the will that people know. Okay, you know, my, and I had, I, how many did had this when they got converted? You know, your friends call you up. Hey, we're going out. We got a party down at the, in the woods and stuff like that. And you're like, Nah, I, I don't think I'm going. What do you mean you're not going? Why not? Well, you know what? I told you I found Christ in my life, and I don't think that's a good thing to do. What? You crazy? All right, we didn't really want you there anyway. So anyway, take care. Have a good life. See, godliness sex separates you from sinners if they don't want to be converted, right? But goodness separates me to God. And I want to be like Him. Why don't I want to be like the qualified idiots? The idiot qualifies. I was that. But now all of a sudden I'm going forward in life and life more abundantly. He's changing my mind. He's changing my heart. Who does that? Christ. He's changing my walk. Who I agree with, who I hang around with. My goodness, if the seventies didn't teach people that, all the great rock stars ended up, most of them ended up in their puke. Change the world. Dead. What happened to Jimi Hendrix? What happened to Jim Morris? What happened to all these these fabled icons? Yeah, I got by. I got every album. I got every album. Really? I burnt all those albums years ago. Why? They brought me back to a place that God delivered, died to deliver me from. Does that make sense to you? Oh, you should have kept them. They'd be worth money. No, they're not worth anything. Why would I want to put that poison on somebody else? That nonsense. And that includes the Beatles, too, like we said today, right? You listen to some of these songs. They're the stupidest songs you ever want to hear. You just listen to the words and you go, how did I listen to that? Oh, yeah, I was on drugs and alcohol all the time. Every, anything sounded good, right? <laughs> and now I'm not, and they don't sound good anymore. They sound stupid. Because I was, uh, what? I was an idiot qualified back then, and now I'm not. I have quality in God. Number two, he uses his, what? His the guilt we have, the emotions. We talked about that. I think we just mentioned that. He uses knowledge emotions right that i feel guilt that happens in a place and that can be killed too you remember what jesus talked about matthew 7 if the light that was within you becomes darkness how great is that darkness you can become reprobate where you don't feel any pain you don't have any conscience at all that's called the social path which we have tons of them in this country they multiply all the time it'd be better if christians multiply than social paths right i don't care yeah, but you just, eh, so what? Who cares? I burn out caring a long time ago. Number three is his goodness. It's the goodness of God in Romans 2, 4 that leads you to repentance. True? God's good to me despite me. He's good to these people. Do they deserve a second chance? No. Do you deserve one? No. Does he reach out with one? Yes. His hand is still stretched out. His goodness prods me. Number four, if that doesn't work, we have left, we have chastisement and rebuke. As many sons as he receives, he does what? He chastens. Revelations 3.19. Hebrews chapter 12, Proverbs 6.23. I need to realize that the ways of life are what? Reproof and instruction. I need to understand that God's trying to make me go further in loving him. And then when I forget my first love, that verse is in the Ephesians church. What happens? He'll discipline me to get my attention. Tries to get my attention, uses life, uses things. I don't want... I don't want my attention on you. I decided to go over here. And what's he do? He disciplines you. Even your own backslidings, if you're saved, will reprove you. I think it's Jeremiah 2.14. They'll reprove you. You'll be, the, you'll be the prodigal in the pigsty, eating corn husks, watching the pigs eat better food. 
And you're saying, in my father's house, the servants eat better than this. Hopefully that brings you home. He uses chastisement. And then he uses final judgment, which is all through the Bible, the book of Revelation, that he is going to judge the world. Because he's the just one. One of his titles here in Acts 3. He's the just one, which he has justice. He will, there will be consequences, because if there's no consequences, no judgment, there's no law. See, we are destroying law today because most of our sentences have no teeth in them. Or people are let go. Isn't that great justice? Not to the ones who got abused. Oh, we're so merciful. Really? We're more merciful than God. We just let people out of prison after they killed somebody or did some heinous thing. We just let them out. I just heard a story the other day. Was Fred was telling me one of his guys, the, the guy literally ran over him and, and stopped on him and peeled out on his stomach and ripped his guts open. He's barely left alive. He, the miracle, he became alive. He's back after about a year. And they let the guy go after a couple months in prison. And he's got to suffer the rest of his life. Is that justice? Not for the guy who had a car on top of his stomach peeling out. No, it's not justice. And so justice will be served the conclusion is that repentance should become a lifestyle. You should be coming more and more. I don't think I finished the first in First John 3, 2. It says, when we see him, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. And then in verse 3, it says, every man that has this hope. Do you have a hope in God? If you do, this is what you're supposed to do. Purify yourself, even as you're pure. In other words, you're supposed to be what? Becoming more and more like Christ, who never sinned, by the way. Will you get there? No, Paul didn't get there at the end. But he walked that way and he got real close, didn't he? How close are you to being like Christ? Do you know, that's the goal. Forget all the goals of the world, money, fame, win this, win that, best in this, best in that. How about to be like Christ? The hope of glory. Is that a goal? That was Paul's goal. I press on towards why I forget everything. Fame, money, all I had in life. It's all nothing but weight and dung to me. I do one thing. I press on. That I might know him. I'm gonna, how am I going to know him? Well, I need to know all about him. I need to cry. I need to rejoice in him. The fellowship of his suffering, right? And the power of his resurrection. So suffering is going to come, but he has resurrection life. He suffered. I'm going to suffer. If I suffer with him, I'll reign with him. I'm going to go through it all. Guess what? And I'm going to press towards the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. The crown. You want goals? They're goals. You know what those goals will do to you? They'll make you stronger emotionally. They'll make you stronger spiritually. They'll make you stronger physically. Because you'll have the eyes of God on yourself. And you know what? You realize you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. They'll make you strong mentally. You'll start memorizing verses and say, you know, I, I can't. Instead of saying I can't, I can do all things through Christ. It was one of our verses, wasn't it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Why don't I know that verse? Can I memorize? Wait a minute. I thought I could do all things through Christ. But, you know, yeah. How much time do you spend on memorizing? Uh, five, uh, two minutes a day, uh, week. Maybe that's why you're not memorizing. I spent a full ten minutes memorizing five verses all week. Duh. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Prioritize. He is preaching Christ as the priority. He is showing Christ, and then when you see the light of God, you see your own iniquities. He is reaching out a hand for you to get rid of your iniquities and be like the one you see. That's Christianity. And that's what we talk about. Because there's nothing out there worth talking about. But in here, there's something worth talking about.
the lover of my soul and yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, you take a word that to the world, to our flesh, the hell is an awful word. And it's our only hope that we would be changed, not just changed, transformed into the image of God. It is the hope of glory, God. It is what Paul labored with travail that Christ be formed in us. We're in Christ. We may be saved, but help us to go and be like him. So, Lord, we just pray for each one of us for conviction, for reproof, for instruction, for new power, Lord, for new motivation, the fear of it and the love of it on both sides. That we might draw closer to you, whatever works, whatever pushes us along. Give it to us, God, for your glory and Lord, for our glory in you. That you might boast on us. In Jesus name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, you're dismissed. Next week, uh, men's breakfast. And from there, amen. God bless you guys.